<clears throat> Thank you very much. Good afternoon, friends, fellow Singaporeans. First of all, let me clarify that I'm speaking here entirely in my own personal capacity, not as a representative of the university, the hospital, or even any political party. Second of all, let me state up front, I'm not an expert on water, nor am I an expert on pricing. I'm not even an expert on fluoridation of water, so I have no comments on what the previous speaker spoke about, although I do think it is important that this question keeps coming up on the internet, that some clear answers are provided by those who are experts. I'm primarily an infectious diseases expert, and I believe a lot in access to water. In fact, I've spent the better part of the last 20 years telling people to wash their hands to save lives. At the same time, I've been someone who believes that we're all created equal and equally entitled to human rights, whether we're rich or poor, regardless of race, language, or religion. And I believe that these fundamental human rights include the right to food, air, water, shelter, security, and essential health care. A lot of people are unhappy about the water price rise. I mean, all of you all are unhappy, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But I'd like to take a slightly view, different view of things. I would like to view this water price rise as a symptom of an underlying disease. In medical school, we learn you don't just treat the symptoms, you treat the disease and you treat the patient as a whole. So I would like to offer some possible differential diagnosis as to why the government has the need to raise the price of water at a time of economic hardship for so many people. So the first possible explanation is maybe there is indeed a real need to raise the price of water because of uncontrollable external forces which have caused the price of water to rise. And this was the explanation that was given at first before they kept changing the explanation. Now, when you examine this, it seems to be unlikely because our current foreign minister was quoted in August 2015, just before the general election. According to Channel News Asia, Minister Vivian Balakrishnan said on August 17, 2015, there is currently no need for an adjustment of the price in water in Singapore. He went on to say the price of water has remained unchanged since 2000, and this is as improvements in membrane technology and productivity have helped defray the costs of labor and equipment. He also said we should bear in mind that desalination and recycling water are energy intensive processes. Hence, the key variable for the future is the price of energy. Nonetheless, given the state of technology and energy prices, there is no need for an adjustment at the time, he said in response to a question from Marine Parade GRC MP. End of quote. Of course, you know, that was before the elections when he said there's no need to raise the price of water. After the elections, of course, things change. The next elections are four years away and many of us have very short memories. The second possibility is that while the cost of energy, which the minister has said was the main contributor to producing water, has gone down, there may be some hidden losses in the companies which produce the water through desalination or recycling, as uh, uh, Mr. Daman has pointed out. While this is not likely, it's not possible to rule it out completely without a full and transparent accounting on how our money is being spent on producing water. Unfortunately, Minister Masago seemed to imply that we're not going to get a transparent accounting anytime soon. I think many people would welcome an approach where we understand the relationship between the cost of producing water and the price of water. Again, we are told water is existential to our survival, just like shelter, food and security. I agree that water is critical, just like food and security, but we get security from the police in return for the taxes that we pay and for rice, for example. The government recognizes that in every Asian culture, rice is life. So they have the Price Control Rice Order of the Price Control Act, Chapter 244, Section 5, which ensures the access of the population to rice because food security is important. And the government recognizes that access to rice is a fundamental human right. To me, they're the same, rice and water. If our right to rice can be guaranteed as a fundamental human right, so can our right to water. Now, the third possibility for the increase in the price of water is that maybe there's a problem with domestic consumption. Maybe all of us are going crazy and showering five times a day. So they need to raise the price to force us to reduce consumption. But a friend of mine who blogs at the website, The Cynical Investor, 
pointed out to me that according to the official government website, which houses government data, daily domestic consumption has stayed fairly constant at 150 litres per capita per day for years. In fact, according to water expert Dr. Cecilia Tortaja, Singapore's domestic water consumption has plummeted from 172 litres per capita in 1995 to 160 litres per capita in 2005 to 150 litres per capita in 2015. So we Singaporeans have worked very hard at bringing down our water use and we're being rewarded for, by, for our hard work by being accused of being complacent and having the price of water rise. This doesn't seem to make sense. The other argument that has been advanced is that water is a security issue. We need to raise periodically the bogeyman of some neighbour raising the price of water to scare Singaporeans into valuing water. Now the answer to that is actually more complex. In fact, first of all, the government has done a pretty good job in making Singapore water independent. In fact, it was reported in an article by Dr. Joey Long, published in the Journal of Contemporary Southeast Asia by the ICES in December 2001, that Singapore was well on its way to becoming water self-sufficient by 2011. Dr. Long, Dr. Long wrote in 2001, at present, Singapore's domestic reservoirs and catchment ponds provide 680,000 cubic meters of water daily, while the rest, 520,000, is imported from Malaysia. He says Singapore's developed desalination program will be capable of supplying 400,000 cubic meters of water. In addition, there'll be 250,000 meters, cubic meters of recycled water daily. All in all, Dr. Long writes, a comfortable volume of water would have been procured indigenously for domestic use, end quote. Now, when he was writing in 2001, he anticipated Singapore's population to be a comfortable 4.3 million in 2010, and eventually plateauing in 2030 to about 4.5 to 5 million. In those days, we thought Singapore would become a technologically advanced nation with high productivity, so we wouldn't need a large population base. But somehow along the way, the, teaching, the thinking changed, and we decided to open the floodgates. And this is painfully strained our infrastructure. The hospitals, the MRT are badly strained. In fact, as I mentioned in the IPS forum, I like being around Singapore on school holidays and long weekends because one million people have left the country and the traffic is better. It's easier to get around in shopping centres and hawker centres. So this is the elephant in the room. We haven't heard from anyone the contribution of the massive rise in population to the demand for water how we would have had enough water without having to depend on imported water by 2011, as the academics had predicted, because if we had 4 million people. But now we're talking about 6.9 or even more population. To put it simply, we need answers. Is the sudden need to raise the price of water because of the need to provide for a massive population increase? If this is so, we should be told, and the issue discussed honestly. And finally, the fourth possibility is, is the government so out of touch with Singaporeans that they think the price of water is so trivial that nobody will notice? The argument is made for wealthy Singaporeans, the price is a small amount. For poor Singaporeans, the government gives you save vouchers, which will cancel out the impact. People ask, why raise the price with your right hand and give out vouchers with the left hand? Isn't that extremely wasteful, creating a bureaucracy to administer the vouchers and collect the additional charges? Why not simply exempt the poorest households and who consumed the lowest amount of water. In fact, as you heard just now, that is how water was priced in the 1970s and 80s, way before the new technologies that we have, and at a time when relations with our neighbours were not so good. It is tempting to think that the government is simply out of touch and too elitist, but my experience in GE 2015 showed me how this works. About a week after the elections, I was in my clinic when a long-time patient rolled in on his motorized wheelchair with his daughter, who's a nurse. They both congratulated me on a well-run campaign. And then I asked them, where do you live? The old man said to me somewhat sheepishly, we live in Ihua, and you know, Grace Fu has done so much for us. She even gave us a motorized wheelchair. Hold on a minute, I said. That motorized wheelchair didn't come from Grace Fu. It came from your money as a taxpayer. Then he said, no, 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 no. She came to our house with a whole entourage of grassroots people and taking photos. She brought it. I couldn't convince him. As long as we have that kind of system in place, 
the ruling party can simply raise any charge any time they want and then marshal their grassroots teams to compassionately provide vouchers out of the other pocket to help those badly affected by their own policies. It's brilliant. Even Lenin couldn't have thought of this. So I think that the water price increase is a symptom, it's not the disease. It seems to reflect some underlying problem in the relationship between the rulers and the ruled here in Singapore. I don't think it's our fault that we have become complacent or that we're ignorant of how important water is to all of us. I think we need some answers to the important questions about how much water is needed by 4 million people, by 5 million people, by 6.9 people, million people. And also, where does this money go to? Until we get some honest answers, we should keep asking questions. Thank you to the organizers of this rally and thank you all for being here. Let's keep asking questions and hopefully we'll get some answers someday. Thank you.